bang. Oh no! How oh, dare you, that was lame. to my little one, but are you really a friend to us? Regardless, a little one brings you a gift to demonstrate our appreciation. Cool. Take a look around really quick. Oh, 
serve on his command. Whoa, be on to you. Serves that, huh?
where'd you go? What the hell, you son of a bitch. Awesome. All right, 
Cry out for Big Daddy's help. Make him think you're a little sister. Watch as he fights to protect you. Boo. Where'd that crazy bitch go? Did she go? Is this where I'm supposed to go? Oh yeah.
gonna help you, bastard. The warp rat didn't get himself at. You got something from me and my crew? Or are you just looking to get criticized? You set here a spell. I need to set on some coffee. Maybe put on silverware and the like. <laughs> What? Before you head into the fisheries, a word to the wise. All peachy seems about as straight as a dog's hind leg. You keep your eyes open. Nobody walks into my swampy carrying the heat. Put your weapons in the new hall, and then I'll let you in. If that's the price, you're gonna have to pay it. But he can't very well take your plasma away now, can he? That is chipping me out. La 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 la. Oh 
my god, really? Damn it.
sense to such a filthy man. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There we go.
Okay. Upgrade station. himself up. The director's commentary or something like that.
future vision. You can't quit. Fontaine will find you. Whoa. Fuck Fontaine. You don't fuck Fontaine. Fontaine fucks you. Fontaine. Who the fuck is Fontaine? One of the biggest challenges Irrational faced when developing Bioshock was figuring out a way to retain the feeling of a deep RPG while making the game accessible to a broader console audience. Ultimately, the team succeeded in creating an intricate system of weapon and character upgrades that gave the player choice and customization while keeping the gameplay fast, lean, and engaging. For real. One of the hallmarks of Bioshock, to me at least, was that it, it really blended RPG and sort of first-person action game together in a way that, you know, is, is sort of standard today, but a decade ago was, was really pretty revolutionary. And I know for the team, I think at some point it became clear that you wanted this to work on consoles, not on PC, right? Well, both, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so the idea of, you know, doing a console game and a PC, a PC game and doing something that sort of felt like a shooter but had much more depth. And I know in, in some of the early design docs you talked about sort of creating an FPS plus versus an RPG light. What was the difference in your mind between those two? I think for us is the game of the big difference between System Shock and Bioshock ended up being that System Shock was more about your character growth and Bioshock was more about the environment. Because with System Shock, we really didn't have System Shock 2, we didn't really have the either the art team to make enough assets or the visual power to sort of make a, comp a really convincing environment. But as we started working on Bioshock, the art team was so strong that the ability to tell a story within the environment became the most important thing about the game. And that was sort of not something we thought right at the beginning. That was not really a concept we had. But as we started building things, we could realize that the visual world was the star this thing, the rapture was really the star of this thing. And telling the story outside of cutscenes, telling it in the world so the gamer could ex discover the story rather than us telling him the story, telling him or her the story. And it was still very much for the time, uh, I think for the time, quite different than what you had seen in terms of there wasn't a lot of growth in shooters. So right. it was still, I think for the time, very, very revolutionary. But I think System Shock 2 was even more ahead of its time in terms of, of that growth thing. Um, because we defocused a little bit primarily, part of it was just figuring out how to do that all on a console controller was, was very tricky. No, I remember even the early demos, people were like, you know, you see a plasma, you see like an upgraded weapon, people were like, oh, I've never seen that before in a shooter. And that was, you know, when you were coming out of the sort of, you know, the Quake, Doom, Half-Life, where it's like you have, you know, eight weapons on the keyboard and you sort of knew what they were and they weren't going to change. Yeah. Sean, was that something that you know, from a sort of creative standpoint, was it always clear that that was something you guys wanted to do or it evolved over time because you wanted to have more depth in the game? I mean, it certainly evolved over time and each, you know, upgrade path was slightly, you know, had its own unique challenges. Like certainly upgrading the weapons, you had to design a base weapon that didn't feel like crap, still felt like something that you wanted to use, but then the ability to add the upgrades to, to that, and each of the upgrades can come in any order, so you have to be aware that this, you know, parts A, B, and C could come in at any different time to upgrade the weapon. In a first-person shooter, that's your star. That's the thing that you're seeing all the time. When it comes to other things, plasmids, uh, things that are, you know... Tonics. Tonics, yes, sorry. It's been a while. Come on, Sean. <laughs> I know, it's 10 years. Those things were more offloaded to machines that you would then have to interact with so you're not carrying the inventory around with you. But each, each of these decisions on you know, how we're going to upgrade the player 
Yeah, it wasn't like a mouse and keyboard. Okay, we can just use the mouse, and you have all these buttons at your disposal. You could arbitrarily point at a part of the screen really yeah. easily, which you could do in System Shock too. Yeah, so we certainly, you know, learned trial by fire when we were trying to adapt these things to the console at the time. Yeah, and like having you know different ammo types and stuff like that. Like we went through numerous, numerous iterations of the interface to make it. Uh, like we had the first times when we sort of put the interface into play it was very obtuse and very tricky to get your head around and we just kept working on it and working on it and working on it because you want to feel like second nature and but that was we spent a lot of time on that what motivated the idea of having uh, so much choice in the way you could sort of play through this game? What, was it to you know, give the player a, a better sense of authorship over the experience, or what, what was driving that? I've always liked the idea of giving the player a lot of agency in terms of their play style yeah. and experimenting with the play style and trying different things and seeing what worked and didn't work and interacting with the environment. The notion that it's sort of a playground that you get to play around with and, and imprint your own desire on was great, because I think we were more skeptical about being able to do that with story at the time. In fact, so much to the point where that become almost like a joke. You know, that becomes the meta joke of the game of how little agency you have in, in, in your story. But agency in terms of how you play the experience and how you load out your weapons and how you interact with the environment, as compared to most shooters at the time where basically like you can shoot them with a the shotgun or shoot them with the, you know, the pistol. That was really important to us. So we spent a lot of time trying to make the game, the world react in a way that you would expect and hope it to react when you tried something. Right. And some of those system or decisions we made about systems fed back into the narrative, like locking Adam behind Big Daddy and the little sister. Like you can't get Adam unless you deal with the Big Daddy, which then becomes a roving boss fight, which then becomes another system that I don't know if we planned that from the start or it was one of those happy, like, you know, serendipity, like, oh, this decision that we made about putting Adam behind the Big Daddy totally works because now we have a different type of boss fight that you hadn't really seen uh, actually, in other games. Actually, it was, bad. it was the other way because what happened was is originally there was no concept of Adam and Big Daddy just had money and other treasure on them like every yeah. other splicer. Yeah. And they were so tough, nobody would ever fight them because why on earth would yeah. you go after that guy? Right, go off a bunch of small splicers and get the same amount. Yeah. So we had to come up with a, a currency that was exclusive to them because yeah. we knew that was where the fun was, right? But we also knew people were terrified of them and we didn't want to fight right. them. Yeah. So game, video game development and system development is a lot like economics, right? You know, in economics, you try to encourage certain behaviors through tax, usually through tax policy. You know, well, you want business growth, so you lower taxes on, on certain segments of the business economy, or you want to encourage you know, people to move into this area, so you make incentives to move in here. We had to make an incentive for players to fight the big daddy, and Adam became that incentive. And then, once you had this Adam, then you had a new piece of narrative, which you they could then incorporate back into the story. Yeah. Talk a bit about the the plasmids and the vending machines and that sort of whole approach to I guess what is kind of a tech tree, but you know, and, and coming from PC games, you know, used to strategy games and whatnot with very complicated ways of how you would upgrade things. I thought you guys did a really interest. You had a really interesting approach to how you made it very accessible to a console audience. How did that evolve? Was like, did you know the vending machines were going to be there from the get go? Well, we had vending machines in System Shock too, so we were sort of lifting that. And I always thought that was a fun. Um, it was a fun notion to because it's a it's a affordance that people already understand. You know, they see a machine, a vending machine, they know immediately. Oh, that's where I buy stuff, right? Yeah. And you also then have to have a shopkeep. When we talked about wanting to make things, put limitations on ourselves so things felt fully believable. Yeah. If we had a shopkeeper sitting there, you can't shoot him. He right. sits there. He doesn't say anything. And all of a sudden, he feels fake. Where a vending machine, the Circus of Values machine, can feel 100% authentic, you know, despite the fact that it's selling like ammo and stuff like that, <laughs> you know, which is. You but know, in an objectivist society where you don't have rules and regulations right, on you that have type of thing, it, it feeds back into the narrative. But you don't then break the fiction at all by having these characters who sort of don't really live and breathe in the world. So the vending machines became an important part of that. But we still want to give them character, and hence the, you know, and so. 
that clown image came from a piece of, um, that image is actually from like a, a fruit container or something uh -huh. from like the 1940s. Okay. And so we had a book of like royalty free images and I saw that image and I'm like, let's call, let's put that clown on it. We'll call it Circus of Values. And then, you know, we wrote a line, some lines for it, decided he'd be this sort of asshole clown. And then, um, then we hired the best actor in the world uh -huh. to play that part. That was, that was me. Uh, <laughs> well, and I cost, the, my biggest Avengers, I didn't cost anything. Um, I didn't know you were, really? I was a clown. Yeah. No, I was a clown. Um, I hear it in my head every night. Uh, my wife hates that voice. She <laughs> hates that voice. You can give us a little of it right here. Welcome to the Circus of Values. She does not allow me to do that, so oh, I, okay. I do it outside of the house. Okay. But it, it allowed us to, it allowed us to have something that felt very rich and very real while being very limited at the same time. And also, you know, the plasmids and sort of the motif of sort of the videos and how you explain sort of what a plasmid was, that was a really fun way, I thought, to sort of explain that. Sean, how did you guys evolve that? Because it was a very art Again, artistic I think, approach. I think those came on pretty late, too, because we, you know, we were developing all these systems and you make the assumptions because you're dealing with them every day that the player who gets this game is going to understand what these systems are. And you know, we always joke that you can't ship a developer with a game or you can't expect somebody to have a readme file for all of these things. Nobody's understanding what these plasmids are or how to use them. How do we present these to the audience in, in such a way that they're gonna understand what it is fictionally and what it is functionally? I feel as Rob Waters did a lot of the, the animations on those. And we sit down and we, you know, write out like a little 30 second commercial of what this thing is. And again, because going back to the narrative, this is what would happen in Rapture. People are trying to sell these things, so they would come up with commercials to explain why you need this. Using that as, as your framework, you can then come up with all of these you know, little, little gags that people will remember that have a little personality to them, but I think ultimately in the end weren't that expensive to, no, to we, create because they're cheap. I think the, one of the most important things about it is we sent, we, we didn't want them to be long and we didn't have a lot of budget for the arts. We have like a couple of frames of animation yeah. in them essentially. And so we had to figure out how do we message how this thing works in like that. And, and that's what marketing is, right? You know, it's how do you message what, how something works. And marketing and tutorializing are very similar things, right? You're trying to get a message across in a very brief period of time in a very snappy fashion. And I think that one of the things that I, I always felt about games is that tutorials are sort of death. And because they're usually like, you know, the, you go into a scene and, there's like a, tra a shooting range or something like that, and you narratively they never really make sense oh, either. And they're so boring. And so we always try to put a big burden on ourselves of of how do we train people while not letting them know they're being trained. And brevity is really important to that. So we sort of we had a bunch of art constraints on that, which also led to a bunch of writing constraints. And so those things were like I don't even know if they were thirty seconds. Yeah, they were like really short. Seconds. Yeah, like fifteen seconds long. We had to explain a whole plasmid in that period of time, yeah. and I think that was a good exercise because it also made the game, it forced us to be concise and to really explain what this thing was like that. Throw objects at foes. You can even catch grenades and throw them back. Just run back.
Oh my gosh. I'm risking my life for you. 